There's always options. You know, right? Yeah. And it was just like a Yeah. And it was just like Yo, uh, yeah, I didn't get a pat on this thing either. Do you have the um, the invest with Aloha or invest at MF Capital Partners login for Zoom? Yeah, so it's just the invest at MF Family Mindset. No, invest or at mfcapitalpartners.com. Yeah. Um, so yeah, do you know that password? No, I know it. Yeah, that's yeah. Do I need to log in through that? Well, that's what I was saying. Um, I just logged in now, and there's people in the waiting room, but I didn't want to let nobody in because I'm. Okay, just... so it's just a it's just a normal Zoom then. Yeah, it's a normal Zoom. It's not like a webinar. Show us that link. All right, but it's like it's a, just like invite anybody and just share with me that one. Send it on Slack if you don't mind, real quick. Beautiful, brother. I'll be on. I'll be on shortly. All right, brother. Sounds good. Thanks, bro. Bye. Yo. Yo, sweet. Yo, Ryan, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Hey, is okay. uh, Jackson hopping on to moderator now? Yeah, he's gonna hop on. He's uh, he just got to his house. He said he was helping some people and uh, uh, deliver some packages. He's getting on right now. So, okay. let me see. I'm trying to look for the um. Hey, I do. Uh, I do want to make sure that this is uh, no more than forty-five minutes. Okay. Uh, because we have our meeting right afterwards, and I, I need fifteen minutes before that. Um, I got to get something done before I hop on that. Okay, no worries, brother. So um, this, uh, this is my. I'm going to be pretty, pretty uh, on point with really just ardent on the essentially the same thing that you went over at right? the uh, the slides that you had. Yep. Yeah, that's the one we do every week for the MFM ones. Yeah, bro. Yeah. So I'll be chill, dude. Okay. Uh, yeah, let me pull this up in case. Um, Here, I can pull it up too, man. No problem. I can just pull up the slides. Okay, perfect. It's a yeah. PDF, right? So. Yeah, I just sent the newest one in the, our Slack. Yeah. How do I do it where it's full screen? So you got to download it and then open it oh. up, open the file. Oh, okay. And then, yeah, he was saying, he was talking about that video, but I don't know if I have it. Hold on. I am. I got it. Okay. You want me to start it up without the, the video? Uh, Yeah, I might want to do an introduction, dude. No big deal. All right, cool. Now, how do we do a full set, a uh, full thing? I, I downloaded it. So then you open the file up, double click on the yeah. file. Yeah. And then in the top right, there should be, or in the top left, there should be a green, the green expand button. Oh, just do that then. Okay, I got gotcha. you. I got it, brother. Okay. All right, I'm going to start it up. Okay. All right. Or as the, as the kids say, back. Exactly. There we go. Everybody's jumping in. Um. 
All righty. Hello, everyone. Hello. 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 Uh, want to make sure that the, the chat is working. If you guys can put in the chat where you guys are from and uh, what workshop uh, you guys went to. Oh, okay. So, so you're making the active changes to it right now. From Orlando, we got Orlando in the house. Fort Myers, we got Atlanta. Orlando, Fort Lauderdale, Tampa. We got Florida in the house. We're right here based out of Orlando. Our office is in Ocoee. Perfect. Awesome. We'll let get a few minutes, let some more people hop on here. Beautiful, beautiful. And then put in the chat also, who was your speaker? Who was your speaker at the workshop? Oh, Tyler. Oh, you guys are lucky you guys had Tyler. Mr. Tyler Devro himself. Love that. The boy Jake. The boy Jake is amazing. Jim Anderson is great. Oh, Todd. Oh, uh, okay. If y'all got Todd, that's a special one, too. That's awesome. Well, I have my, uh, the one and only Mr. Ryan Willie on today. And we're going to be over going over a lot of cool stuff. And also Jackson, the man Jackson Campbell is hopping on. Give me one sec. We still got a few people joining, so we'll give about another minute. Estero, Florida, huh? Oh, boy. Heard that name in a while. Oh, Estero. Yeah. I don't even know where that's at. That's Cynthia terrible. says, I think Ryan's amazing. Thank you, Cynthia. I appreciate that. <laughs> Ryan will take all the compliments, yo. I'll take, take it. Take it. All right. Awesome. People in here. All right. Here's Jackson. Let him in. And all righty. Mr. Ryan Woolley, man, are you able to share your screen with us? I can, I can. First, before I share the screen, uh, I, I'm just going to go over a, a few things. So Mr. Jackson's here. First Welcome. Of, Sorry, y'all. I, I apologize for the delay, y'all. I really, I really, I really, I truly do. That is on me. And I apologize to y'all. Ryan, I specifically apologize to you, my man. I know your oh. time is so valuable, man. So I apologize for that. No, let's, let's uh, listen. You, you know, the reality is this, man. Obviously, hearts are heavy in Maui right now. Jackson was out delivering stuff for, for uh, some of the folks in Lahaina. I know a lot of us here in Florida, which I think is the majority of you, understand uh, natural tragedies. Right? We, we, we experience hurricanes every year. Fort Myers, you guys were hit pretty, pretty hard last year and saw a lot of that. And so Jackson, over the last week, uh, has been nonstop back and forth. So just, you know, really, man, just a lot of gratitude towards him and those living out there, uh, you know, giving lending hands. So. I, think I great, appreciate man. I that. Think that's, that's really I like I think that, Kristen's wearing a, a shirt saying "Think bigger, man." Think bigger is is that right? It's those values, right? Those core values that we all have. Absolutely, and it's been a it's been a really humbling experience um, from all the donations that we've gotten from the network and from people that that know us out here and that know Tyler and that know multifamily mindset and that know multifamily capital partners. Um, it's been overwhelming and humbling and truly truly inspiring the outreach from the community for the people in this disaster and even from the people from from the mainland and their donations and people reaching out to check on me and check on our other team members in the office Nico Stratton Tyler and Brittany and our families it's been it's been remarkable and we have felt y'all's love immensely so from the bottom of my heart and I, I can speak from I can speak this um, to everybody else from everybody else on the team we're just extremely grateful for y'all's support um, continue to send it continue to send the donations as you can um, Alex I see you just asked in the chat where can we send the donations Jay if you don't mind sending that 
or Greg. I know we've got Greg here too. If we don't mind sending that donation link um, in the chat, um, that would be that would be amazing. Um, but yes, thank you for everybody that's done that. I, I super appreciate it. But nonetheless, let's let's get going here on this webinar here, Ryan. Um, super grateful to have you on, brother. Um, for those of you that don't know Ryan, Ryan is a managing member at Multifamily Capital Partners. I don't know if, if Jay already gave an introduction here, but Ryan is a co-founder of Multifamily Mindset, managing partner and managing member at Multifamily Capital Partners. And the wealth of knowledge that this man has is incredible. Um, he's taught me um, mo so many things, so many, so many things, but probably the thing that I've learned most from Ryan in business and in this industry is how to love people and how to give value to people. Ryan is the ultimate value add. You put you put Ryan in any situation, he's going to add value, and he's and he's so good at helping everybody. This is one of Ryan's super talents: is helping everybody understand the numbers behind these deals and how they're going to be profitable. So very very lucky to have Ryan on the call today. But Ryan, if you don't mind, yeah, sharing your screen. Um, if you need me to, I can as well. Or Jay, if you have that ability, that'd be awesome as well. But let's turn the time over to you. Ryan. We're, very, we're very excited to hear from you today. Awesome, awesome. Well, I appreciate all the kind words. Uh, I guess let me ask in the chat. Uh, I was at a few of the events. I was at the Orlando event, and I was at the Fort Myers event. I kind of popped my head into the uh, Tampa event for a very short minute. Uh, but let me ask you this. Was I at any of your events? You know, go ahead and put it in the chat. I uh, was able to meet you. Do I know you or did you see who I was? Did I go over my story? I'll share a little bit of my story and who I am and how I got started. Uh, but uh, but I always love to see uh, if I ran into you at the Florida, I call it the Florida track. I'm a, I'm a big uh, big golfer, right? Or like the Florida swing, you know, we have our, our golf tournaments here. Awesome. Yep, Chris, I met you. I do remember you in Orlando. It's awesome. Or Misha, uh, yeah. Yep, I know Misha. I definitely know we've met for sure. Met in Orlando. Yep, Cynthia. Awesome. Perfect. Well, a little bit about me for uh, you know those I did meet. And I shared my story. I actually grew up in the industry. I had a grandfather that owned multifamily. You know, at, at the end of the day, you know, uh, everyone always asks, "Why do you do it?" You know, why do you guys do this? It's the same reason for any of your investors that you're talking to. Today's uh, webinar is primarily, you know, obviously MF Capital Partners. We have opportunities. We have the Aloha Fund that we're currently working right now. And we're going to share that opportunity with you today. We're going to tell you kind of how the fund uh, works. But more importantly, we're going to go over how we present opportunity to investors. So hopefully by the end of the call, you'll see how we prepare for the opportunities, how we identify uh, what's going on in the market, right? What objections that investors may or may not have. And then how do we prepare maybe for a webinar? How do we prepare for uh, an, an, an introduction or an opportunity in general? You know, but for me, you know, really one thing I love to ask investors is, is why are they investing? I take that all the way back and see what my grandfather left for us. My grandfather invested in multifamily. In fact, he was a general contractor and, and built a couple of his own complexes. So my grandfather was, he, he was the, he held the note, right? He was the lender on it, right? Which is where he made a lot more of his money. Um, but my grandfather's uh, trust fund, I'll say this, it was a trust fund for the family to do reunions. It was a trust fund to, to keep the family unit close together, right? Most of the time when people die, you know, families kind of, they go their own ways, right, over time. So my grandfather, he didn't want that. That trust fund lasted 28 years, right? Because of what he did and the investments that he had, generational wealth was important to him. You know, because of the examples that he set, he had a lot of, uh, you know, of his grandkids, uh, great grandkids who have, who've all performed you know, extremely important service projects. They've uh, graduated college. They've gone uh, on uh, you know, a long way because of the example that my grandfather set. One of the things I look at investment is generational wealth, right? Or you know, maybe times our investors need the money right now. We've got an investor named Doug. Doug needs cash flow right now. He quit a job at Microsoft and he's utilized the, the portfolio that he had sold off most of his single family homes and invested it with us in, in, our, in our funds. Uh, and so for us, you know, the, the relationship is important. As you guys go out and you guys went and raised money, the first day you guys were at the event, whether it was a Thursday or Friday, that first day they asked you to do an exercise. And in that exercise, they asked you to raise money. They actually, you know, they asked you to stick to a script, 
right? Go out and raise, I think the example was $25,000 or $50,000, right? So I'd love to ask you guys, um, how much money did each of you guys raise at, that, at those events? Go ahead and put it into the chat. What did y'all raise? 35K, that's awesome. 50K, that's great. Some more 50k 50k are you seeing those ryan 150k yeah, yeah, yeah. 225 awesome 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 keep them coming in because we like to take a look at those yeah you know so I, I look at it and in a very short time in a matter of an hour and a half i see these numbers right i see these numbers they all raised you know now imagine putting some thought process into it imagine putting some some money into a campaign or reaching out to most investors, right? And being able to raise more, right? The biggest thing though, is what do most investors want? Most investors want an opportunity to place that money right away. So a lot of you, you as you went out and raised, right? What were some of the questions? And this is uh, one of the things about these webinars, I like them to be very interactive. You'll notice sometimes we invite our, our MFN students to our MFCP calls as well. Right, this call, this webinar is only for MFM students. Um, but you'll notice we approach things a little bit differently on the MSCP calls. So I like these to be a little more interactive. But what were some of the objections or what are some of the questions that were brought up? And you can take it off mute if you wanted to say it instead of typing it. What are some of the questions that you got asked when you were raising the money? Um, can I speak? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go for it. Hi, this is Cynthia. So one of the questions was, um, what are you talking about? Where am I going to put my money in? I need to know more. Need to know more. Need to know more. Very good. Very common one. I love it. Who else? How safe is it? I see that. How safe is it? They want to see actual numbers on past deals. They wanted to see the financials. Interested in more details. Right? This is typically what we get, Right? What we get is as you go out and you raise money on your first deal, right? As you raise money on your first deal, they want to know, all right, tell me about the deal, man. I want to place it right now. And you're going to find that that's the case with most investors. You present an opportunity. They say, now what? Show me the opportunity. The question I would have is at the event, did you have an opportunity? Or since the event, do you have opportunities to place your investors in? That's how they were taxed. Yeah, I love those. They love uh, see the uh, return on investment. Is this a scheme? Yeah, I would love that one. I always think that's funny. It's a real thing though. Like people do ask that. It's really funny though. I'm not quite there yet. I need to talk to your uh, to our accountant. Yeah, that's very common. Awesome. So one of the things though is, is deals. Did you guys did you have money at that time, or did you have opportunities in front of you to be able to place those investors right away? The answer is probably no. Right. Obviously, you're new into the program, right? You're still searching out. You're going through the path. You're determining what direction or what seat or what role do you want to have within the company, right? Or within a new, newly formed company, right? For me, I was an underwriter. I didn't know that I was good at raising capital. But when I finally realized that what did the investors want to know, a lot of you guys put return on investment. And I have, uh, they just sent me things saying I'm sharing the wrong one. So I'm going to have Jay share the, the right one. Ryan, so I've got have, it. I can, I can share it. I've got it. Okay, cool. And so, um, you know, with that being said, a lot of you guys put in there, you put in, um, you know, what is the return on investment? When I really realized that the return on investment was really the underwriting aspect of things, I found out very quickly, I was actually a really good capital raiser. I could answer any question and every question that, a, that an investor had, right? I want you to think about that. You don't have to be good at numbers or Excel spreadsheets. You just have to know which questions they're asking about, right? Hey, taxes, have you looked at taxes? Your CapEx, what are you doing to the property, right? Have you looked at insurance costs? Man, your expenses are really high. Why are they really high? So I just have to know within the, uh, within the Excel spreadsheet, what numbers are they looking at? So when you put a return in, uh, 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 on investment, right, at the very top of your underwriting template, it's going to have a place where it says 18%, 16%, 20%, being able to read that. Is it over three years? Is it over five years? Those are very common things that your investors are going to uh, ask. What is the whole time? 
Are you going to refinance, right? When are you going to exit? Could you potentially exit sooner? What is my, what is my quarterly return going to be? Those are all answered on a spreadsheet. So the better that you understand how that, uh, how the underwriting works, the more, you know, the, the more informed you will be to give those answers to your investor and the better capital raiser you'll be. All right. So I learned very quickly that, that I was actually very good. The other thing was this. I, I love to go over why do they want to invest, right? Part of being a good, I'd say, a salesperson. In fact, let me ask you this. What, how many of y'all are salespeople in your, in your career right now? You can put a thumbs up. You can put me, whatever you want in the chat. Realtor, yeah, very good. That's definitely 100% sales. I would, I would beg to differ. Most jobs have some sort of sales, right, Ryan? I, I would say so. We all sell ourselves, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The reality is this. The best salespeople are the ones that ask more questions, right? The discovery questions is what we call it in sales, right? So what discovery questions are you asking your investors, right? Why do you want to invest? Where are you currently investing right now, right? What type of returns are you getting right now? How long of a hold period are you looking for, right? Those are the questions that we want to ask. We want to get more information, right? I'll give you an example of, a, of a, an investor call I had last week. I typically don't hop on the calls. Jay and his team are the ones that oversee that, all right? I, uh, I had a phone call last week with an investor. Now, with that investment opportunity, they have single family homes and rentals, okay? Some of y'all, uh, when, they, when they did it all said and done, they were getting about 5% return on their money. Right, that's after all fees and everything paid out. About five percent return on their money. Okay, and they had money in stocks. Is right around five to six percent. Okay, is that good in today's market? I, I don't know. Right, I mean, some people are comfortable with that five to six percent. You know, when I look at it, and I went to the bank the other day, they asked me to invest my money. Right, obviously our bankers they see every single one of our accounts, and that's more. Right, tell me about the opportunities. Some of the opportunities they had were 10%. So I asked this guy, his name is Ray. And I said, Ray, why, why would I invest money with you guys? Help me understand, right? Why would I invest there when we're getting average, on average in our portfolio, over 20%, right? Over 20%. So, you know, uh, what Ray didn't do, he didn't ask the right questions, right? Ray just didn't ask the right questions, okay? He should have asked, where am I currently investing my money? What type of returns? Am I diversified, right? Or am I not diversified? Real estate in general brings in the most money, right? It's what, we, you know, the, the biggest, the, the most people that have the most wealth in this world invest in real estate. We all know that. That's why you guys, have, you know, join the class. Uh, and so ask the right questions. So in talking to them, I set proper expectations. So the questions that I would ask you is this. One of the next steps that we go over, right? Uh, and I'll go over kind of our, our company here in a minute because uh, I we go over this with with our investors. You can put it there, Jay. Is Wait. um is what are the objections today in today's market? Right. Let's throw those out in the chat. What are the, what are the objections in today's market? Miguel, yeah, we definitely record this. We'll send this out to y'all. Go ahead and throw in the chat, or you can unmute it. I really, yeah, either one. I like hearing voices. Chat's fine as well. I just don't see as much of the chat. Interest rates, awesome. Keep them coming. What are some of the objections or potential perceived objections? This is what we do at MF Capital Partners. We have a huddle room. You actually saw a picture up there of the huddle room. Um, more important, the most important thing, Jackson, in the huddle room is what. Well, the what would you say? The snacks in the corner. The, the snacks, fridge, the right? Sodas, the sodas and the snacks <laughs> in the corner. You gotta have those as you had them, right? The role Got play. It. The role <laughs> play. There you go. That could be the most. Lending. Mark is doing bad, right? And Tony, I want you to remember that one because I forget to talk about it. I want you to bring it up. Risk, recession, market, volatility, market again, money being tied up for too long. Yep, definitely. Too much happening, uncertainty. Is there uncertainty in the market or are we just looking for the wrong deals? Right in 2008, Blackstone, the investment company Blackstone, if you don't know who they are, uh, you should look it up. The CEO, Charles uh, uh, Schwarzum, 
he, he has a, a, a phenomenal book. He talks about 2008, right? What happened in 2008 it was a recession again, right? You know, we're going through some of the similar things as we did in 2008. In fact, commercial market will take a bigger hit, uh, you know, uh, with what we're going on right now, which is what comes into volatility, right? You know, some investors may, may see, hey, we're going to take a, a, a major hit. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why. And, and the Wall Street Journal, and if you haven't looked it up, this is an important thing. Investors will look this up, especially your high net worth individuals. Wall Street Journal came out about a month and a half, two months ago with a report that that a operator lost 3,200 units in Houston, Texas. All you got to do is look up 3,200 units, Houston, Texas, uh, a multifamily loss. Look that up, pull that report up. You should probably read it. They lost it. Oh, someone said they can't hear anything. Can you guys hear me all right? Yeah, I can hear you just fine, Ryan. Mark, I'm afraid that might be an issue on your side, my man. Is everybody else? Can I just get a thumbs up if everybody else can still have audio? Yep, it looks like that might just be you there, Mark. Continue, Ryan. Mark, sorry about that, man. Awesome. So what happened with the 3,200 units is, is, is a lot of things. And there are a lot of things with what your investors are going to, to ask, right? I think it's important to bring this up, okay? Is one of the reasons that, that they lost the 3,200 units is they got into a, a, their, their loan to value was a, almost 80%. What that means is they borrowed way too much money, okay? When they borrow a lot of money, your debt surface is extremely high. So if anything were to happen, right, your expenses start to go up, meaning this was in Houston, Texas. Property taxes went way up, right? Uh, insurance went way up. Those things were not controllable. They went up. And so what happens now, they're not able to pay their bills. So in order to pay their bills, how do they pay it? Well, they end up taking out of their CapEx that they raised for for other projects. Well, when you take out of your CapEx, right, you're not able to put that money into your interior units. You're not able to fix up the exterior units. You're not able to do the things that are actually going to get you the return on investment. They were actually using the CapEx to pay their bills, right, which is awful, okay? Some of the other things was the adjustable rate uh, uh, loan, right? In a bridge debt, it was not a fixed rate. Those rates went up from 4 or 5%, and they went all the way up to 9%. So I want you to think about that. On 3,200 units, I don't even know how much it was. I think it was close to $100 million, maybe $70 million in, in assets, maybe more. I, I, I don't even know what the number was. I want you to think about what that debt service is, right? I want you to think about how much that is. Going from 5% to percent you know, most of y'all are pretty savvy with numbers. You can imagine that debt service almost doubled, right? Almost doubled. They weren't accounting for it. Debt service is the hardest thing to, to get, you know, back from. Taxes, the next hardest thing, okay? And so what happens is a lot of these things they didn't account for, they lost the property. So what happens yeah. is, well, Oh, so, okay, thought someone was going to ask a question. So what happened is, is you see a lot of investors who look at the Wall Street Journal, they get online and they see this kind of stuff up, you know, that, that pops up. They just start to get very, very nervous about, uh, about properties. So I really want to go over some of, uh, of the things that we look for, right? So I want to talk to you a little bit about, uh, uh, you know, track record. Someone mentioned their track record. Show me your exit deals. MF Capital Partners, we've done 28 deals. We've gone full cycle on 13 uh, deals altogether, right? And so our track record is pretty impressive. You know, we've done uh, really that 3,700 units out day. We've done closer to 4,000 units. We have two offices. As you get bigger, sometimes accredited investors or high net worth individuals want to see that you're actually hiring on employees to keep up, uh, with, you know, to keep up with the amount of units that you're taking down. We have offices in Maui. We have offices in Orlando. Uh, on the MF Capital Partners side, we have 22 team members. We're actually adding a few more. Uh, we're in six different states. We uh, our portfolio is close to 400 million, and this is the number I get I, I get excited about. Equity created is 118 million. Okay, so when we look at track record, that's what, what that's what investors want to see. So I want you to relate it to as you guys get into deal. We talk about sponsors of the event. One of the biggest things that you go in and as you uh, address it and you talk to investors. They're going to know who your team is, right? Who's your team? Is it MF Capital Partners? There's other sponsors such as Vanessa Alfaro, uh, Brian Briscoe. There is Cynthia Harding. There is uh, Maled. There's a bunch of sponsors within the network. Chemical is actually one of the coaches she can match you up with. It's important to know who your sponsor is so as you address your investors, you know who to go to. Go and go to the next one, Jax. Yep. So, you know, the next thing they're going to go over the track record, right? MF Capital Partners, our whole investor relations team knows what our track record is. 
Okay, so these are the top two items that most investors are gonna ask. Some of you guys put in the exited deal, okay? Is uh, cash on cash. Why is cash on cash important? Well, when we tell them they're gonna get a preferred return, most in, in today's market, it's right around 6%. That means for every 100,000 they invest, they're getting about 6,000 a year, okay? On their money. They're gonna make a majority of their money at exit, okay? We'll go and see in the next, next, on the next uh, pie chart there, you'll see what the, uh, the actual annual rate of return is. When we do properties in the big three that you guys should have gone over, what is the cash on cash that we want the property to be at? See if you guys know this on the big three. Let's see if you got there on the path yet. What's your cash on cash you want your properties to be at? 9%. 9%, there you go, 9%. Yep, right around 9%, that's the target amount. Does that mean you have to be there at acquisitions? No, right? Uh, in today's market, that 9% is going to be really a, around the 18-month mark, uh, mark. So here's the thing. Most of the uh, the deals that we projected in year one were 7.85%. Okay, the actual exit was 12.65 when we exited. So what does that number mean? So if we were paying a 6% preferred return and we were talking to an investor and they were nervous about us being able to pay uh, distributions to them, one of the things that we look at, we say, listen, when we've acquired or our projection on our properties has been 7.85%, uh, our properties cash on cash average has averaged to be about 12.65. So what does that mean? It gives us the ability to be able to pay cash flow. It gives us the ability to be able to pay distribution. These are the historical numbers. Now, mind you, some of our properties have performed extremely well. Some maybe not so much. This is what our average is. When we look at our annual rate of return, what we look at is, you know, most investors want to know when you've exited deals or the team that you're on, when they've exited, right? What does that look like? Okay. So our projection on most of the deals that we've done are around 22%, 21.8%, right? And, and so I tell this to everyone, I hate this next number. Our actual annual rate of return is 38%. Well, I think we're all savvy enough on this phone call to know that 38% is extremely hard in today's market. Would you guys agree with that? 38% is just not realistic. If you were to go and tell investors today that 38% is what our track record is or, or what your team's track record is, right? You would probably lose quite some credibility, right? They would probably say that you're full of crap, right? That that's not realistic. So what we do on our investor relations side right now, the training that we do is we set proper expectations. For you guys out of the gate, as you present deals and opportunities to your investors, you should always be networking within the, uh, within the network, right? To see what deals are out there that you can raise for it. You want to place investor money as quickly as possible. If not, those people die out, right? Those investors will phase, off, uh, phase out and they'll place their money somewhere else, right? I'm a passive investor. I invest in people's deals, okay? If I don't hear from you again or you don't have an opportunity, I'm looking elsewhere to place my money. The, the, I, I would say the misconception that most new students have is that they wait to get their first deal, right? They wait to get their first deal, which is a worst thing that you can do right imagine if you can place your investors into a deal you can get you know you can get credibility there you can get credit whether it's from an lp position or a gp position and you're able to go i know that we have some brokers and i know that uh kristen you're a broker uh in in the orlando market i believe um the reality is if you went to an agent or a broker and you were able to say hey listen i own multifamily properties right they don't need to know if you're an lp position or a gp I own multifamily. What kind of credibility does that do for you? Right? What credibility does that do? Right? Most investors, if they know that you own multifamily, you know, most brokers, most investors, they're going to take you a lot more serious. Right? So we're going to talk about some opportunities uh, you know, where you can be LP, and we'll talk about some GP opportunity as well. Right? The 38%, we're never going to say that. What we like to say is, look, our portfolio right now, the targeted area is 16 to 18%. That's pretty realistic in today's market for, for, uh, for real estate. So what we like to tell them is, listen, we like to under promise over deliver. Even if our track record is at 38%, you know, I'm going to tell them, listen, we do north of 20%. Uh, 20%. We do north of 20%. But our main goal is this. Our main goal is to do what our business plan tells you and better. That's what our business plan is. So let me ask you this. If you guys had a, an opportunity that was 16 to 18%, Right? Would you invest in it today?
getting awesome. a lot of head nods here. I don't know if you're seeing those, Ryan. A lot of people nodding their head. A lot of people saying yes, thumbs up. Absolutely. Absolutely. Anyone would, right? You know, I just gave you the example of uh, the investor I spoke with is making 5%. That's what, that's a majority of Americans today, guys. That's 60% uh, plus of Americans that have money invested are making right around 5 to 8%. No more, no less, right? They're making right around on average. Okay? Most of them aren't savvy enough. They don't know the opportunities out there to make more. Now, if you go to the bank, most banks are going to talk to you if you have a substantial amount of money, right? The bank knows I have over $300,000. They're going to present different opportunities than that of someone that has 10000 right? So the reality is, is at 10%, that's not what we make here. 16 to 18% is really good today. So Jackson, you don't mind going to the next one there. We're going to go over some, uh, you know, so, some, uh, some areas here to, to focus on, right? You know, what do we look at? We look at we look at the market. We look at cash flow potential, what the value add opportunities are, what cap rates are, what cash on cash is what we looked at. And then risk management, risk assessment, exit strategies. You guys mentioned that there, right? Is your your assessment that you have, right? Your exit strategy. Most investors that you go to and talk to, they're gonna say, Hey, how long is the investment? Well, listen, it is most investments uh, that you get into, right? And, and the term sheets on deals are five to seven years, right? They're five to seven years. You're never gonna tell an investor seven years. Most of our criteria of hold times is three to five years. In today's market, it's pretty realistic that you're gonna hold a property for five years. Don't sugarcoat that, right? Don't, don't tell someone something that's not factual or true. You don't ever wanna to go to your investor and say two to three years if that's not the case. So the one thing that we tell investors is this, we go through different phases. And if you're going to write anything down on today's call, this is what you write down, okay? There's three phases in investments, okay? It's the, the, the uh, stabilization period, right? That's phase one. We want to stabilize our asset. Most of the deals that we go after are going to be mismanaged properties, okay? Those mismanaged properties, uh, we want to stabilize. That period takes six to 10 months, at least. Most of the times, three quarters, okay? Six to 10 months. The second period is, is your value add one. Now, these guys probably get uh, sick and tired of hearing this. I call it, I call it moving day. I'm a big golfer. You guys are in Florida. If you're a golfer, you get it. Moving day is Saturday. Okay. It's the third day of the tournament, right? That's our value add, that's our value add phase in multifamily. Your 10-month mark to your 18-month mark, you want to uh, you want to push the gas pedal down, right? Meaning this. You're gonna you're going to raise rents, okay? By that time, the ten month mark, most of your leases have expired, okay? Now that doesn't mean, right? That doesn't mean, <laughs> excuse me here, that when you when you have people where their lease expires after taking over, let's say two months after taking over, let's say that you were two or three hundred dollars under market rent, you can now take that to market rent. We're not going to wait ten months to do that. We're going to do it as soon as that lease expires. What I mean by the 10-month mark is that that's a pretty, a pretty good indication that you can take a majority of your rents now and you can take those to market. Now what we're doing is we're taking the interior units and we're fixing all of those up, okay? So think about this. If we can go in on some of those new ones and let's say 12 months down the road, 13 months, 14 months down the road, it's a new lease comes up and I can fix up those units and now I can get another $200 or $100 on those units, what does that do for you? You see this? It's exponentially going up. Now we've, we've taken it to market rent. We're fixing up the units, right? It's that, it, it's that what we call forced appreciation. We're forcing appreciation at that point. All right? Now the third phase is this, okay? I'm going I'm to repeat myself. First phase is stabilization. That's typically six to 10 months. Second phase, right, is 10 months to 18 months, Okay? Now your last phase is your 18 to 24 uh, month mark. That's called your exit strategy, right? We're gonna look at the market and what's going on in the market. And we're going to see if we were to sell this property in today's market, would our investors get above an 18 to 20% return, okay? So let's say I get to the, to the 18 month mark and I know and I talk to our brokers that I can sell our properties, right? That I can sell our properties and let's say that I told uh, I told you guys, Antonio shook his head before, and Kimberly, I saw you guys both shake your head, right? You're on my front of my screen here, okay? So let's say that we were able to get a 25% return by selling, right? 
Would our investors reinvest with us? If they got a 25% return, you can put it into the chat if you'd like. Would they re reinvest with us? While you guys answer, I'm going to take a drink. All right, I want to talk about experience, right? As it, Everything that we do is all about investor experience. Okay? So you saw our track record is over 20%. There's a reason why it's over 20%. Some people will say, why not hold on to the property and get cash flow? We all know that you make your money in the equity part of it, right? We all know that. Now, if I can take your money and I can put it into another deal where I can force, uh, force that appreciation and make you more money and higher returns, guess what? Your investors are going to continue to always reinvest with you. Guess what else happened? They start telling their friends and family members where they're investing, right? One of the biggest goals is to turn one investor into two investors, right? That's what your goal is constantly. And so that's what we do in the three phases. If you guys want, I can repeat those phases. If not, I, we can move on. The exit phase after 18 months is the exit strategy. We want to look at it at the 18 to 24 month mark. Even though we hold our properties for five, three to five years, we're going to look at that. Okay, I'll tell you about one of our portfolios we sold off. Those deals, we uh, I think the lowest Jackson was what? 30%. I think the highest was 54% was the highest yeah. on the exit. That, that deal, we killed it. In fact, the 54% was one of the case studies you guys went over on day two of the three-day class, right? That was a 54% return to investors. Pretty amazing, right? That's not typical though, right? We just absolutely killed that because we bought it at such a low price. Okay? Cynthia said, gonna, so juicy. So juicy, Ryan. Juicy. It's a juicy return for sure. It's like my sandwich today, man. It was so juicy, man. It was like, <laughs> man, oh, it's so good. Ryan, maybe we could highlight quickly um, our two most recent acquisitions. I know, yeah. I know you, you, you're going, you, you, everything that you're covering is so, so, so great. I just know we're kind of coming up on time here. And I know I just want to respect yeah. your time. Maybe we can highlight some of our investments here that we've done at MFCP, kind of review those two, and then maybe kind of explain how everybody can get involved in those investments. Yeah. You guys want to hear about two of our latest acquisitions? Awesome. Perfect. So Orlando Sky, we actually sponsored with a student, man. I tell you, a couple students actually, right? There's Marcus Turner, there's Rashad Decur, there's uh, Marichelle and Yannick. So we sponsored this deal with them. So this deal is awesome. We closed at the end of December, okay? This deal is 140 units, 15.7 million. We asked for a little bit of a discount on this, okay? The annual rate of return is 18%. The raise was $7 million. Let me tell you about this deal, right? This deal was $300 under market rent. $300 under market rent right? Six months through this deal already. We've owned this deal for what, seven months, almost eight months now. Eight and a half months is what we've owned it. Okay. In eight and a half months, we're, we've already hit our, our year one targeted goals. Meaning here's the reality. We keep going where we're going. We talked about force appreciation. If we told investors five year hold, right, we're on track to be able to sell this deal in two and a half years. So I always ask Jackson this question, Jackson, what's the longest hold period we've ever held a property three i'll give it to you three years three years there you go i didn't know if he was on here or I'm muted three years most of our deals have been right around the two two and a half year mark there's reasons why we go in and we force appreciation okay now i want you to think about this if you were to invest a hundred thousand dollars with us in the fund this is in the aloha fund this deal if you were to invest a hundred thousand dollars okay one of the things that we like to tell our investors is what we call net present value what is your $100,000 worth today? Now, I diversify my money. I have money in, 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 uh, in, in crypto. I just not talk about it. Anyway, I have my money in Forex. In my Forex account, it talks, you know, I have money there, okay? And it tells me where my money's at today, how much I've made, right? And so the reality is we want to let our investors know the same thing. Even if they're not getting a preferred return, they still want to know how much their money's worth. It's important for us to market and show that to them so they see that their money's working for them. As we present other future opportunities, they know their money's working so they're going to reinvest with us. So if you invested 100 grand with us eight months ago, your money is, is worth about $25,000, right? So your initial capital plus 25 grand is $125,000, right? Is that a pretty good investment for those who invested in the Orlando Sky in an eight-month period? 
yeah, that's that. For those anyone who says no, it's like, holy crud, man. Oh, it's like, all right, let's have let's have a talk off the screen, right? Yeah, absolutely, right? It's 125 grand in an eight month period, or so 25 grand in profit, not too bad. There's a reason why, right? With this deal, right, Orlando Sky, we got into an adjustable rate loan. That interest rate was 8.3%. It's capped at 8.3%. Okay. We knew that we could go in and stabilize this asset, right? We had the experience to do so. And guess what? It was going to take us two years to stabilize to get into agency debt. Well, guess what? We're right at that mark where we have a lender looking at it to put it into fixed rates. So our investors, as they have received distributions, right? As they've, if they've seen their money grow for them, Guess what happens, right? When they find out that we're able to go into a 5.8% interest rates, is that going to make them more cash flow? Absolutely, they will make more money now, all right? So here's the thing. We always want to let our investors know what's going on with our properties. Why? Because you're going to see on our next property here. Our next property is, is Arden Place. When we have deals like the next deal that comes up, we want to continue to communicate with our investors on previous properties to let them know what's going on, right? More importantly, we're going to go over objections. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Arden Place. We closed on that one about 45 days ago. Uh, Arden Place, we did, we went over, we sit in the huddle room and we go over what the objections are, okay? What are the objections in today's market? You guys said interest rates going up, volatility in the market, people losing deals, uncertainty. You talk about, um, you know, uh, inexperienced maybe operators, whatever the case may be, right? So as we sat down, what we do is we go over on our board, we go over what all of the objections are, and then we go over what all the pros are on the deal, right? We go over objections of the investor versus the pros of the deal. So I'm gonna go over the pros of this deal, okay? This is the most recent, I'm getting old, right? I'm 45, I'm starting to forget things. So, all right, so I have to write things down. So 114 unit deal. Okay, $9 million purchase price. I want you to look at this thing. It says 25% ARR. There's a point that we put 25%. That's for, this is for educational purposes only, okay? $6 million raise, okay? So the reason I tell you, I'm gonna start out with the 25%. Remember what I told you, under promise, uh, over deliver. On art in place, okay, when we underwrote the deal, because it was uh, uh, underperforming, right, and mismanaged, when we underwrote it, this is what the this is what the return should be on this deal is around twenty five percent. Here's the reality: if you were to put twenty five percent down and told your investors twenty five percent, and they only got twenty one percent, do you think that they're going to second guess investing with you again? Right, twenty one percent is great, right? But what happens is they look at it and they go, "Well, you told me twenty five, you only did twenty one, so am I going to believe the next deal you did?" They may invest with you again, but if you continue that trend, they're not going to invest with you, okay? So what we do, we like to under-promise, over-deliver, right? So what we do is we tell investors 18%. We know in the back of our head, this deal is probably going to do 25% or better, right? We under-promise, over-deliver. Now, if I told the investors 18% and they got 21%, right, would they invest with you again? Absolutely, they're going to invest. Under-promise, over-deliver, okay? So let me tell you a little bit about Art in Place. This, this seller lost the property, okay? I'm gonna speed it up here real quick too. This individual lost the property because it was too high of a, a loan to value, right? 80%, okay? Interest rate was way too high. They had to dig into their CapEx, and then we talked about this at the very beginning of the call. They dug into their CapEx, they didn't have any more money, and they were gonna lose it to the bank. So what they did is they settled with the bank in a deed in lieu of foreclosure, which means they were forced to sell, okay? So that they didn't hit on their credit, right? They didn't foreclose on a deal. That would be extremely bad. So we got this deal of $32,000 under market. So I guys want you guys to pull out your calculators and do a, a quick little uh, calculation. What is 114 units times $32,000? You can say it or put it in the chat. 114 times 32,000. 3,648,000. I love it. I love it. Thank you for that. 3.648 million, okay? All right, so what does that mean to, to you and your investors, right? On this deal, the investor, or the seller should have sold this property for roughly $12.6 million, right? 
They lost $3.6 million because they were forced to sell, right? They weren't able to fix up a lot of their interior units. They weren't able to get the increase in rents. They focused on high occupancy, which is the worst thing you could do, right? And they were going to lose it. So when we're, we're uh, presenting this to the investors, Jackson, what I say, when we get into this deal, I look at it and go, just don't mess it up. We just if can't all, mess it up. Just don't yeah. mess it up, right? Too just good, don't mess it yeah. Up. For those of you who have potty mouths, you probably say a different word. <laughs> so the reality is we've got kids on the call, so we can't say bad words, Kimberly. So <laughs> thank uh, you. <laughs> yeah. So the reality is this. If we just stabilize the property, we've got 3.6 million essentially in equity, right? As the market corrects, we've got about 3.6 million in equity. All right. So I want you to think about that. That number is roughly 61% return to investors. 61%. Is that pretty good? That's freaking amazing, right? That's amazing. And that's, and that's before all the value add business plan is implemented, correct? 100%, 100%. Awesome. So I'm doing some math here. Uh, if we were to hold the deal for only four years, uh, Jackson, for only four years and we sold it off and just stabilized it, that's over 15% return to their investors. Amazing. Let me amazing. ask you this. Let me ask you this. I told you at the beginning, we would, we, we would provide an opportunity. If you knew that you could be a part of a fund and that you could count, Jackson, help me out here. What's 140 plus 114? 140 so plus 114, 288. No, 140 plus, uh, plus 114, 254. Oh, two, sorry, 254. There you go, there you go. That's never my strong suit, Ryan, you know that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you could invest in two deals right now, right? And have ownership into two deals and be able to go tell investors you own 254 units, right? Or you tell a broker that you own two different properties and you own 254 units, right? How many of you guys would like to tell a broker and investors that? Right now. Yep. Absolutely. Immediately. Immediately. Right? Here's the reality, right? We have a, we have a fund where we, where we have deals like this that we place investors in, Right. In fact, um, uh, Jay will probably uh, put the link in here soon, right? But if I were to tell you this, based on is. the knowledge you have with Orlando Sky or Art in Place, how many of you guys would invest in a deal like this? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, right? The reality is this. We want to always present opportunities, right? We're going to do this. The great thing about Art in Place is this. Our interest rate on that is 5.8%. Uh, I told you Orlando Sky is performing well above where it's at at 8.3%. We're getting ready to uh, refinance that. Art in Place right, is at 5.8%. It's a stable uh, asset. One of the reasons you guys said was interest rates were going up. Those are the objections we want to do. Let me tell you about one of the other things in Art in Place, and we're going to wrap this up here in a minute, is we realized that one of the reasons the seller lost this property right, is that they did not have enough CapEx. When you look at that 25% right there, okay, one of the things that I like to do is I like to buy down my, my, uh, my annual ready return. Now, what do I mean by that? I'm going to raise more money than what I typically need to, and I'm going to keep that money on hand. What am I going to do with that extra money? I can use it for operating expenses for a year. I can use it for debt service in case, let's say, expenses get high one time. I could use it for distribution to investors. I can use it however I want. Whatever we, uh, you know, uh, what we did, and we raised an additional $750,000 into this deal to take that down to 18%. I want you to think about, about that. When investors are so scared today with the volatility of the market, and they know that you raised almost an additional million dollars into this deal to stabilize it, to make sure that we always have enough money on hand, do most investors realize that this is a short-term problem in today's market. Absolutely. 2008, right? Some people say yes. 2008, right? It lasted about really a year. The bounce back is really two to three years. But most people that got into the market right away and got into deals that people were losing all made their money. I brought up Blackstone. Blackstone made a majority of their money in 2008 when the market crashed. How did they do that? They bought it in what we called a pre-buyer phase one, right? As the market starts to dip, we want to go in and scoop up all those deals. Well, essentially, that's what you saw. We saw the market dipping when we purchased Orlando Sky. Art in place, right? We got that deal. 
right? And it is the reason why, right? In just the first month, we already took a, uh, no, we took a 25% of the uh, the units and we've already raised them 21%. What do you think about that? 25% of the units, right? So roughly 30 units. We've already taken up 21% in renewals or increased the market, uh, the market rent growth on it, right? One of the things the MF Capital Partners, we're always looking for mismanaged properties to be able to force appreciation. So can you guys start seeing how we prepare for opportunity versus whatever, right? Maybe the objection the investor has, right? On Art in Place, what do we do? We got it at a discounted rate, right? So we want to make sure we talk to the investors about the discounted rate. We got a fixed rate interest rate, so it's not rising. Most people hear that the Federal Reserve raised interest rates. So what do they think? They think that interest rate is continuing to rise on this. We want to make sure that we get out in front of that and let them know that we have a fixed rate, right? We have a fixed rate on this. We also want to let them know that, listen, we've raised more than enough money on this. In the event that anything were to happen, we had you know, an additional 750000 in addition to our 400000 of CapEx we're fixing up the interior units with. We have that as what we call a reserve, right? Can you see how stable that, that investment is now? It's extremely, it's extremely stable. If something else were to happen, right? We know that the investment and the investor's money is safe. It's secure. Even on art in place, if we were to, if we were just only to stabilize it, right? You can see what the returns would be, right? That 3.6 million would go to investors, right? 61% is a pretty, pretty big, uh, uh, pretty big return for just stabilizing an asset and holding out until the, the market uh, shifts, right? So, with that being said, you see two different deals, right? One of the things we talked about going over with you guys is how to prepare for opportunity. Y'all went out after the event, after the three-day event, or at the first event, on the first day, and you raised some money. But you didn't have opportunity to place those investors, right? Not only could you place your own money into the fund, you could bring you know, your investors into the fund. You, know, you could schedule some time right, on next deals that we have right, to be able to, to take advantage of showing right, that you have assets under management, whether they're from an LP position or GP position, right? You can show that you own multifamily already and build credibility with investors, right? So I'd ask you this, how many of y'all want to go out and you want to show credibility right now? Or how many of you guys want to wait six to eight months, six to eight months to find your own property and put your money and your investor money in? I used to think the same thing, man. Tyler was like, Hey man, let's let's hold our money. Let's not put our money in. Let's hold investor money in and and put it into other deals. I just did a video recently, two weeks ago, that we took our investors and put it into deals immediately. Right? We took our money, put it into deals immediately. Why is that? Well, we wanted to show we wanted to show credibility, right? And investors will take you more serious when you invest uh, when when your money is invested in the deals, right? It's kind of like uh, uh, Chris and I'm going to pick on you right right now. Is she's an agent, right? She'll tell you. If someone were to say, hey, I want to buy a single family home for a flip, but they can't show you proof of funds, what would you do? I would say, sorry, I need your proof of funds first. Yeah, or you'd be out, right? They'd be on the bottom of the list, right? Yeah, They'd I don't want to waste my time. Yeah, you're not going to waste your time. Hmm. Most investors are the same way. Most brokers are the same way. Especially in today's market, they want to see that you have, uh, they want to see that you have, uh, uh, assets under management, right? They want to see that you have a schedule of real estate, okay? Tyler and I, we literally put every single one of our deals that we own, whether it's GP or LP, we just put what ownership that we own of that property, right? So the way that it breaks down is a 70-30, and then we're going to end. I'll open it up to questions because we got to hop off here. But you, when you own it 70-30, 30% on GP, 70% to the LP, you own a part of that entity. You own a part of that investment. What they want to know is what, what ownership that you own of that, right? You know, and so it's important to be able to show your brokers, your investors that, yeah, we do own these opportunities. So it looks like Jay's posted that link in a few times. You know, for those of you guys that are invested, are interested in investing with us, right? Letting your money work for you as you learn the business, right? That you can establish some credibility out of the gate. Click on that link. Talk to Jay and his team. You know, our, like I said, I'm going to say this. I hate 38%. Okay, because that's unfair. That was in a market in 2021 where we sold at seller's phase two, right? If you haven't got that part of the path, go look at it. There's four phases, buyer phase one, buyer phase two, seller phase one, seller phase two. 
And then we, we, we go over it in the three day as well. We sold those off the height of the seller phase two. That's why the return is so high, right? But here's the thing, man. We do over 16 to 18%. You can see on those two deals that we gave you as an example why we make the returns we make, right? Orlando Sky's literally killing it. In fact, for those of you guys in Orlando, we're actually going this weekend, aren't we? This weekend is your fast track? Next week. Is it next week or this week? I think it's next, next weekend. Next weekend, yep. Next weekend, I'm wondering if I should show up. Maybe I show up. Who cool. knows? <laughs> Orlando's Orlando Sky is amazing. And you'll see it. Yeah, I, I call it the ugly duckling survey. It's the I don't think it's the best looking property. It's outside of Pine Hills. And the reality is this, right? If you can invest in a good looking property versus a C type property, right? Most people would invest in this property. It's important to let our investors know if we were to show you the returns, right? Most people would invest in the C property over the A property, right? We want to make sure that we show those to investors, right? What the returns are. We want to educate them just like hopefully we educated you a little bit today in today's call. I want to open it up for about five minutes of, of questions. I realize, Jay, you may have to hop off, but do you have any questions? And then Jackson is going to go over next steps. Yes, yes. Quick question. As you guys, as you guys can tell, why I said wherever Ryan is, he's a value add. I mean, everything that Ryan spoke about on this call just now is so valuable and can be implemented in your businesses that you're starting to create. And as you jump into the multifamily real estate world, everything that Ryan just shared right now is tips and tricks and things that are going to help you fast track your way to success and to credibility. And that and that main thing being investing into, into some properties so you can have that investment under your belt. But Ryan has graciously spared a couple more minutes with us to answer any questions. If anybody has any questions that they would like to ask Ryan quickly for the next couple of minutes, we'll take maybe two, three questions. Good you question. can use the, you can use the raise your hand um, button on your Zoom screen and I can call on you. Or if you just want to simply unmute your mic and kind of pipe up, Brian, go ahead. Notice you were, you were yeah. quick on that. Go ahead. Brian. <laughs> yeah, let's see it. Brian, go sorry, for it. sorry. Great to see you again, Ryan. Um, my question is for other incredible investors, like you were saying, we don't have opportunities right now, but there are investors, there are opportunities through MFC uh, partners. Can we, how do we get those in? How do we, what, what, what have you, because we're on the screen and it looks like it's a personal thing, like myself putting the money in. Would we sign up that way or what, is it a different avenue? Yeah. If you have the ability to invest yourself, right. Invest, you know, the reality is let your money work for you. And you know, one of the biggest questions that investors are uh, going to ask is have you invested in multifamily as well? That's a, a major question that most of you will get asked. You know, when you can go out of the gates and say, yes, we've invested as well. Uh, you know, you're going to establish more credibility out of the gate. Yeah, well, the, right? but you can answer that question immediately and say yes, right? It, it shows a lot. Okay. I actually, the investor I spoke to on that first day was is interested in properties, but I have nothing to show them at the moment because we're, we're learning. Um, yeah, schedule so some time with, uh, with Jay and his team, man. They'd love to go over that opportunity with you. Awesome. We, can, we can place your investors in with us. Appreciate that. It's awesome. Yeah. Absolutely. Question awesome. Answer. Any other questions? Sometimes okay. when you don't ask questions, I, maybe I, I, you know, I delivered it right. Oh, right. It right Jackson. Yeah, maybe you just did such a good job, Brian. They don't have any questions. Yeah, great question. One other thing, same thing with the 401k. If we had other investors who had 401ks, they want to roll those over. Is that a same thing? We'll separate, you know, we'll get a separate discussion going on. Yeah, absolutely, man. Bring them, bring them over. Talk to us. We uh, we're very familiar with how 401ks work. Uh, SEIRAs, SC401ks. We, uh, we just had uh, one for our investors a couple of weeks ago uh, on how to invest through those. Yeah. Awesome. Lumia, thanks, for the, thanks for the comment, Lumila. She said, Ryan went golfing. I actually did not, um, but I went and putted yesterday, if that counts. A little, a little, a little practice. Listen, I, 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 I've got to get ready for a peak partnerships coming up in March. I've got to, uh, got to get ready so I can take some money from, from some of the students before peak partnership. Ooh, I like it. If you're yeah, if you haven't heard time, about peak huh? partnership, definitely get your tickets for peak partnership. We'll throw that. We'll throw that link in the you're chat as well. In. Yeah. Um, Ryan, thank you so much for your time today. My yeah, man, oh, we have one more question. Go ahead, Paul. Uh, yeah. Just, uh, first starting out. Uh, hey Ryan, how you doing? Um, first starting out, how did you figure out like your title that you wanted to be as far as acquisitions go or raising capital asset management and all that stuff? Man, I was nervous, dude. It took me several weeks, if not a couple months, to really identify. I knew that I was great with numbers. I graduated in accounting, so I kind of went with that, right? 
we kind of default to what we think we're good at, right? You know, and, and, I, and I preface it by what we think we're good at. Um, it wasn't until I realized that, man, I knew the underwriting and I had all the information. It was Tyler coming to me for information so he could go raise money, right? When in reality, is I was like, shit, well, I have all the information. I can just go raise the money, you know? And so, like, I, I'm sure you told the story. If you Did you have him as your presenter? Tyler, yes. I was scared. Bro, I was scared the first investor call I got at. I was nervous. I literally, I had to get the script in front of me. It was up on my computer and I literally just read the script. I, I kid you not. It's probably, it sounded awful. Um, they invested though. Um, but um, it wasn't until a little bit where I was like, man, I actually can talk about the market. I can talk about investments. Um, that came, you know, a little bit further down the road when I became better at acquisitions, right? At finding deals. I really just focused on, uh, you know, what our mentor told us, which is underwrite two deals a week. I was always kind of an overachiever. And so I was like, man, I was underwriting 10 a week. You know, I wanted to know all the numbers, you know, whether they were bad deals, good deals. I wanted to speak about everything in the business, right? Like as far as numbers went, I literally got on loop net, crack seed, 1099 properties. I got on everything and underwrote anything in, uh, you know, under the sun. Um, and so by doing that, I, I found out that I was better at one of the areas in, in the business that I really, I'm just still not that good at, um, uh, it's cause I choose not to be good. I'm going to admit something to you guys, due diligence. I hate due diligence. I do not, I hate going to the properties. I know what to look for. I know what I need to do, but it's monotonous work, right? You got to check off. If any of you have been in property management, it sucks. Due diligence sucks, right? Going through service contracts and, and financial, uh, man, we have a team that does all that. So other than that, man, I was good at underwriting. Then I went to capital raising. Then I went to acquisitions. Okay. Now I kind of do it all, you know, but yeah. Great question. Yeah. Great question. Yeah, great question. Good question. Good question. Real, quick, real, real quick, David, Maisha had her hand up. So I just don't want to skip over her. If she go ahead and then we'll, and then okay. we'll jump on over to you, David. No problem. Okay. Just, Hi, everyone. Okay. Hey. Do you want me to go or do you yes, want David go ahead. to go? Yes, go yeah. ahead. Do you want to make sure? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So no, my, my only question was, and you spoke a little bit about credibility and us being new and stuff like that. When I'm trying to source deals, trying to find investors and stuff like that, are we allowed to say that we'll be partnering with MF Capital Partners to use your credibility or would you not, you prefer us to not bring you guys into our stuff while we're trying to find investors because who am I you know like we don't have portfolios yet nobody wants to invest with someone who doesn't have deals already I love where your mind's at I love like I, you're definitely thinking in the right direction sorry Ryan go ahead I, I will say this I, I agree I, I agree Jack but I'll say I, I don't like where your mind's at I'm, I'm gonna differ a little bit right I'm gonna tell you this right who are you Maisha I actually talked to you so yeah. the thing is you're a confident woman right who, who is yes. a business owner, right? That you're a business owner now, right? Like you right. own a business. And so right. the reality is what you're going to do is you're going to talk about your team. One of the biggest mistakes that new students make is that they, they do exactly what you just said. Who am I, right? Like I don't have any properties. You're always going to have a sponsor sign for you. So it's about your team. All new okay. students that try to go out and raise money on their own fail. I'm telling you right now, you may be one of the five or 10 percentile that, that go out and have success. The individual who who, uh, who relies on their sponsor and relies on their team and says, my team and I, right? Not not I, my team. So the better you understand who we are or whoever sponsor, you know, that you use as a sponsor, you understand, understand what their criteria is, what their portfolio is, and you use them, right? The better off you're going to be with your investors. But more importantly, I'm going to say this. If you have the opportunity to invest in the fund, being able to go out and say, yeah, I own two properties, 254 units, Right. Think about the confidence that you have. I used to always okay. like, uh, I used to be always weird about confidence, right? I was always, uh, when I was single, man, I didn't date a lot because I lacked confidence. Well, when you go out, right, you know, women women sense that, right? They, they see that. But when I'm confident, mm -hmm. man, I tell you, it was like the girls that, I, this is a bad analogy, Jackson, I apologize. But the girls I didn't want to date, man, they were all the girls that wanted to date me. Why? Because I was confident, you know? And, and so- it's the same way, man. When we go to investors, we go to brokers and we're confident and we say, hey, listen, I've got 254 units or I've got two deals or as the fund grows and you get a third deal in there being like, hey, I closed. We have a, a, an investor named Paul uh, Jackson, Paul Williams. Every time he was just a passive investor. Every time we closed on a deal, guess what he did? He posted it everywhere. 
And guess what that did? It got traction. It got investors coming to him. He's now sponsoring his own deals. Okay. It's awesome. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Right. Yeah, one more question, more. David, and then I've got a, I've got a meeting I got to jump on, but would love Likewise. to answer. David, go ahead. All right. Um, you know that it's hard here farming in this area because of insurance um, rates and stuff like that, insurance um, premiums. But how do you go about looking in other areas to farm? How is that? How is that? How do we go about that? Yeah, David, what market are you in? Florida. No, yeah, but. Uh, 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 so I, I'm going to teach you real quick, guys. Market is is the specific MSA or the city that you're in. States are uh, the the Florida is the state, right? Uh, and right. so when you go talk to brokers, we want to make sure the MSA, right? Like, hey, I'm in Tampa, I'm in Fort Myers, I'm in Orlando, I'm in you know wherever, right? Um, we get that mistake a lot, and that's something Jackson, if we can put into the, into the path, Absolutely. that's something yeah. we've got to teach a lot better on. I did yeah. the same thing when I started out. I used to say, I'm in the Texas market, and I'd be like, or I'm in North Carolina. They're like, no, what city are you in? And I'd be like. Yeah, no, because it's, it's 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 important to do that though. Just if I don't mind, if you don't mind, I add on top of that is because you're talking about insurance, David. The insurance can vary per market inside of that state. Yeah, so yeah. Are Texas, you in Fort Myers or Tampa? Yeah, I'm in Estero. And where? Estero. Oh, Estero. Where's I don't know where Estero is at. Where is it at? It's in between Fort Myers and Bonita. Oh shit! I actually drove through there on my way home to Orlando. It's like a small city, huh? Like a farming city almost? Yes, yeah, it's, it's a small, small area, not not very huge it, here. Is it closer to Bowling Green? No. Um I, I, I think I know where it's at. I, I think I know where it's at. So you're in South Florida. You're right. Insurance right. is gonna kill you and it's gonna kill you for the next bit in for in that area. South right. Florida is especially during the hurricane season, your insurance rates are gonna be extremely high. My my suggestion would be to go more of like central Florida. Actually, the number four market in the country for smaller cities right now is the villages, right? Because population growth, most people are going into the villages. Um, so I would go there. Uh, I would look at central Florida or I would look more into the Midwest right now. Your Midwest markets are gonna be a lot less in insurance. So like we just, the Arden Place deal is in uh, Georgia. So our insurance is, man, about, it's almost half, about a third less than in any other market that we're in. So I would start looking at some other markets right now. South Florida is a tough market anyway. Uh, Tampa is going to be decent. Your better markets are going to be more of the uh, Orlando into Ocala area. That kind of that kind of thing. If if you're going to be in in Orlando or if you're going to be in Florida, now Tallahassee's not bad. Jacksonville, and then it goes up into really Georgia would be your better market, but. Um, Midwest is going to be your top market in a recession, in an economic downturn. Your Midwest are always your best returns. Okay. Yeah, Lakeland, so. Kimberly, Kimberly Lakeland's all right. Indiana is freaking great, Miguel. So one, Ryan, of, one of the top states out there. So yeah, if you want to go over next steps, Jackson. Absolutely, it would be happy yeah. to. Yeah, go ahead, man. I'll say this, and ending in this, man. Obviously, we have an opportunity. The returns are great. If you have the capital to be able to invest, be able to say that you have, uh, you know, two deals under your belt right away, 244 unit or 254 units, you can see how MF Capital Partners invest. That'd be a great opportunity to, to jump into a deal immediately. So if you haven't clicked on the link, make sure you scroll up. I'm not sure, Jackson, if you have the link. I have it. Uh, Definitely. You have it? Yes. I will send it. Yes, I will send that link right here again. Yes, absolutely. Uh, man, put that in. We're excited to have you guys on here. Hopefully you learned something. Um, yeah, we're just excited to help you guys out, man. So thanks for joining the call. Awesome. Sorry, Ryan, thank you so much. Dude, Ryan, Ryan, thank you so much for being with us. I mean, the value that you add, like I said, wherever you go, and especially on these calls, teaching these high level principles in such a simple way that are easy to comprehend. You're a master at that. So thank you so much for your time. We're very, very grateful for you. For everybody else, real quick, just go over these next steps. Once you fill out that link, this is kind of what you're going to see on the shared screen here. You're going to see some documents. Um, you're going to be able to click on things to be able to see the documents of the deal of investing into the fund, how it's performing, the asset info that's within the fund. There's also a webinar on there that talks about the fund and kind of explains really what that investment looks like. So jump in there like Ryan keeps alluding to. Click on that link. I'll send it right here again. I know there's some people be throwing some more stuff in there. So there's that link one more time. Jump on there. Fill out all that information. 
And then we will be reaching out to you to talk to you, to answer any questions that you might have. Right, Jackson, I got to hop on a meeting, man. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you so much, Ryan. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and wrap the call up here as well. Y'all are incredible. Thank you so much for being here. Please, please, please reach out to us if there's anything we can do for you. Or if y'all have any questions, email us at support at the multifamilymindset.com. We love y'all. We appreciate y'all. Have a great rest of your day and a great rest of your week. Take care, y'all. You too. Thanks. Say it loud. Thank you, bigger. Think bigger. I love it. See ya. <laughs> <laughs>